Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today I've got a very special guest and that is Dan Held from Kraken. He's the Director of Business Development. He's an early adopter in the Bitcoin space and we're going to be talking all about that macro background and what he sees um, in the future for Bitcoin. So thanks so much for joining us today, Dan. Oh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, for those that haven't followed you, do you want to maybe give us a bit of your background? I know you've got really interesting um, background in terms of what got you into Bitcoin and what you do now. So I'd love for you to give us that rundown. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I uh, got in, interested in Bitcoin in 2012. Uh, my buddy paid me back for a beer with a Cassatius coin, those physical gold gold coins that we see all over those news headlines. Yes. That's a uh, really cheesy looking <laughs> gold coin. So I got paid back for a beer with that. And that for me at that time in 2012 was a good bridge from the physical or analog to digital world of, of Bitcoin. And I started to dig into it and I learned that it had a 21 million hard cap, which I thought was a breakthrough in monetary policy. Um, I had studied finance in undergrad and was it was my junior year when the 2008 financial crisis happened. So for me to see my you know, fellow students, my teachers, the, the books I read and the people that we watched on TV that created this whole financial system, you know, for all of them not to have any idea what was going on really shook my confidence. So that was sort of the, uh, the backdrop to, uh, you know, when I found Bitcoin in 2012, where I, you know, I saw this and I was like, wow, this is incredible from a monetary policy perspective. And then demonstrably with Silk Road, mm -hmm. you know, Silk Road demonstrated the immutability of Bitcoin that these transactions couldn't be censored. And I thought that was incredible. And so I started to go down the rabbit hole. I worked at a small investment firm in Dallas and they relocated me to San Francisco, January, 2013. I got plugged into the Bitcoin community in San Francisco. And at that time, it was just like a dozen people like Charlie Lee, uh, Jen McCaleb, uh, Brian and Fred from Coinbase, uh, Jared Kenna from Trade Hill. And it was a bunch of us in a cooler of PBRs. <laughs> and uh, March, 2013 hit, people forget that 2013 had two bubbles and the price went from $10 to 260. And it was in that moment that I decided to build my first product called Zero Block. Zero Block is like the Blockfolio equivalent in terms of functionality and popularity back from uh, 2013. Yeah. And so we became really popular in 2013. We had a price tracker, charts, newsfeed, and we were acquired by blockchain.info. And I came on board at blockchain as the first product manager there. Uh, from there, I worked at ChangeTip, which did micropayments over social media. And then I went to go work at Uber on Writer Growth and the intelligence team. Uh, Writer Growth was a product team. Intelligence team was more of a kind of a macro function that worked across multiple orgs. And after that, I went to go start up Interchange. And Interchange did post-trade reconciliation for crypto hedge funds. And we were acquired by Kraken in uh, 2019. So I've had two crypto exits. I've worked across price trackers, mobile price trackers, wallets, uh, block explorers, accounting software, micropayments, and exchanges in crypto. And what's your favorite part of the Bitcoin world these days? Or do you think it's still yet to come? Are there aspects that you think people still aren't appreciating enough? Or is it the, the digital gold side of things we're going to talk about today that really gets you excited? Yeah, the digital gold side gets me super excited. That's what got me excited day one. And I think a lot of people really gloss over that where they're like, oh, cool, Bitcoin's money or Bitcoin's about payments or gold. But they're like, yeah, but what else can it do? Like they act like that's super boring. So, yeah, yeah I'd love to dig in on that with you today. Absolutely. So that's something we talk about a lot on the channel. And there's two, I guess, extremes of that spectrum. We've got this um, world of negative interest rates and people are parking all this money in bonds and they're thinking, it's almost the greater fool theory, isn't it? They're thinking that central banks are going to come along and print some money and buy this bond off them for a higher price. And then we've got the other end of the spectrum where we've got hyperinflation in these developing nations. And so whatever it is that you need protection from, Bitcoin offers that. And I think what's different to that 2017 bubble is now there's so many mobile apps. You know, Binance have um, launched this white label thing yesterday, you know, whether it's Wire or, you know, Kraken, whatever it is, there's so many ways for people to just click a few buttons on their phone app and, and park their wealth in Bitcoin. So do you agree with all that? Is that the stuff that gets you excited? Oh yeah, I mean back in <laughs> back in 2013, 2014, none of us knew what the hell we were doing. Yeah. Uh, it was a tiny space, man. And let's put it this way, no A players in tech 
wanted to put their name on crypto, mm. right? Like if you're an A player, this is a good way to like shoot yourself in the foot permanently. Yeah. Luckily I had no pedigree. I had no idea what I was doing. And it uh, turns out that I made a product in a very niche market that became not a niche market. And that, that, that kind of launched my trajectory from finance into tech. Um, but now we've got so many great people building products. We've got so many pipes plugged in. You know, if you think about the liquidity from the traditional world as, you know, different sizes of pipes, we used to have very, very thin, tiny pipes yes. of you know, re retail ACH flows and wires to these exchanges like Kraken and, and others. Mm -hmm. And now we've got these big pipes for institutions to come trade. Uh, whereas all these previous bubbles before this had a very small amount of actual net flow or like fiat money into Bitcoin. Mm. And so I think, you know, I, this is not a popular opinion, but uh, it's, not, it's not unpopular, but it's not a common opinion yes. that we could be a Bitcoin super cycle. You know, who's to say that Bitcoin's price would follow a normal trajectory of just a classic retail boom bust cycle with a very small amount of money. I mean, we're talking hundreds of trillions of dollars of the world. Mm. And if just, you know, one one hundredth of a percent of that flows into Bitcoin, then Bitcoin's way over $100,000. Yeah. Um, you know, and you look at the hodler base and like, who's going to buy that Bitcoin? Like someone's got to sell it <laughs> and, uh, you know, good, good luck getting a hodler to part with their coin. Absolutely. It's so funny you say that in 2012, I, I couldn't work out how to buy Bitcoin in Australia when I'd read about it. And then in 2013, we had, um, you know, Krakens and Bitstamps. But again, I was like, are they going to accept someone from Australia? And then finally, we got the on ramps and, and whatnot in Australia. Uh, but now, as you say, this hyperinflation, this money that's just been printed, that is just going to go into Bitcoin through these big pipes all these negative interest rates. Once Bitcoin just continues to mature and get this name and reputation for itself as digital gold, then wealth managers are going to park 1% in Bitcoin. So yeah, the floodgates can really open. And that's I kind of find it funny when we look at the day-to-day -day price movements and people are arguing over, oh, is he going to pull back to 8,000? And I think we're just going to look back at 100,000 and be like, we're splitting hairs here. Oh, it's the same way that if you look back at... Uh you know, 80 to a hundred dollars or 800 to a thousand dollars. I've been through this. I've been through the 13 cycle, the 17 cycle, and this one will be the same. Uh, we've got good objective reasoning as to why we should see another bubble. We've got a halving event, which creates somewhat of a price shock. Mm. And then we also have increased demand. And I don't see why Bitcoin would move beyond 0.1% of the world population. Yeah. There's plenty more people to buy in. There's plenty more institutions that might want to buy in. All it takes is a few catalyst moments, a few critical individuals, and the price itself. As the price goes up, more people talk about it, which increases awareness, which increases more people buying into it. Mm. And it's, it's a viral loop. You know, Satoshi, as we equal a brilliant marketer, as he is a, you know, a core protocol developer. Mm. Yeah, at, at time of recording, guys, it's the uh, 18th or 19th of Feb, and we've just had our biggest week across socials since 2017, and we've only just ticked past 10K, so I think it is going to be nuts once we pass 20,000. But uh, we're only five minutes into the interview, Dan. We've already said super cycle and 100,000, so let's uh, take it back a notch and talk about the threats. So, you know, we've got Secretary Mnuchin talking about, oh, we're going to come out and we're really going to crack down and these, you know, FAFTA rules and whatnot. So what are the biggest threats to Bitcoin? Are you a believer that even if the US to, are to make Bitcoin illegal, you can't really ever ban software that's open source? Yeah, I mean, you can, you know, the US banning Bitcoin right now would certainly have been its, its uh, growth arc from here down to like here, you know. It changes the tra trajectory of it becoming a new money, uh, becoming a global, you know, safe haven asset. But it doesn't stop it. Yes. Um, also, the bigger Bitcoin grows, you know, a lot of people really focus on mining, and we can we can delve into that if we'd like. Which is the security spend around mining, essentially proof of work incentivizes miners to act uh, properly because they've already got sunk costs. But people don't think about the other game theoretic protection Bitcoin has, mm -hmm. which are the hodlers. The hodlers have some of their net worth, which is a you know, money isn't just a number. It's a representation of time and energy that you spent to earn it. Yeah. They've got a percentage of that in Bitcoin. If the government bans Bitcoin, they're essentially damaging that percentage of the population that ha that holds Bitcoin. So what happens when the hodler base is 25 to 30 percent of a country's citizens? Are you really going to ban it and then have 30% of people not vote for you in the next election? Yeah. 
you know, it's a really strong incentivization method uh, because now people have skin in the game to vote and to guide policy to ensure that their bags are safe. Yeah, and as you say, even I'd even go lower numbers than that. Look at what it took for people to put on a yellow vest or to start, you know, burning banks in Chile or Iran. It's just that that little inkling of people saying that the government are coming after their means of storing value or their livelihood or putting food on the table for their family. As governments are cracking down on all those things, and if they're cracking down on Bitcoin, it's probably because they they've got other things at the back of their mind that they want to do with monetary policy. Um, so I definitely right. think people are going to put on yellow vests and not just sit down and take it. Yeah, and if they do that as well, it's a, it's another sort of game theoretic outcome where a the most powerful entity in the current financial system, if they flinch and are afraid of Bitcoin, then it empowers Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, You sort of recognize its legitimacy and you recognize its threat to your own existence. And since the existing banking system is completely just based on faith, then that is a very, very dangerous set of dominoes to begin to fall. If you recognize Bitcoin as a threat to you, then you recognize that you're weak or and or that you're somewhat fragile. Mm. If that occurs, then it might accelerate the outflows. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting for you to talk about what it was like um, being at the coalface in 2014 and 15 when the narrative became, oh, blockchain, not Bitcoin, from a lot of the banks. And that and that's probably when if Bitcoin was ever going to fail, they could have shut it down there. But the you know the genie's out of the bottle now. We're seeing more and more people turn to Bitcoin. We've got you know Microsoft building on the Bitcoin public blockchain. So yeah, what was that like when banks were dismissing it back then? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty hilarious, right? Like, you know, one is that Bitcoin, it's kind of nice that they don't, if they, it's kind of great that banks and the traditional financial system, including regulators, view us as these kind of like weird gold buggy types. It's good because when Bitcoin does become 20 or 30% of the world's population or the US's population owns Bitcoin in the next bubble, now it becomes a real threat. So they kind of have regarded it as like, okay, you guys go play, play, no, go play monetary policy, go play in your little digital playground of fake money. Mm. And we're like, okay, cool, we'll go do this. And then once we do become big enough that we are a threat, then it'll be too late. So I'm very fortunate that it was largely regarded as kind of a, a quirky little backwater sort of community for a long time. It definitely let Bitcoin survive kind of that early development that it needed to, to grow and, and thrive through. Um, you know, 1415 is kind of when that banking narrative or blockchain, not Bitcoin, took off. And, you know, the people saying that were largely suit types. You got, you got a bunch of guys from, you know, what would be uh, consulting firms, accounting firms and big banks slapping on, you know, whatever sort of jargon that they needed to to get stakeholder buy in. Mm. People were incentivized to say the word blockchain. So if you are an old dude who is an executive at Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Exxon Mobil, you can barely turn on your fucking cell phone. I mean, these guys are relics, right? Um, they're, good, they're good at business, but they don't know tech at all. And so if someone goes, what's your tech strategy for 2017 at that time, you know, they would go, well, blockchain? And since no one knew what it meant, it largely avoided the question. And it was like this like completely perfect buzzword that you could use for anything. Yeah. And so big companies were incentivized to say it. Banks were incentivized to say it because banks were like, people were going, hey, banks, you know, what's your innovation strategy to, you know, help the underbanked and unbanked and cut costs? And they're like, blockchain. Yeah, yeah. And then if you're a startup, putting the word blockchain in your deck got you 5x more funding, and which extends your runway. And so all the market participants were very much incentivized to say the word blockchain, even though the word was completely meaningless. Yeah, it's funny, even... You know, 12 months ago, maybe 18 months ago, central banks were literally coming out and saying that the space is too small. It's not going to affect monetary policy. And look at that for a backflip. It's like uh, like Jerome Powell's backflip from uh, raising rates to cutting rates again. Central banks all of a sudden are talking about how this is a big threat. We need to regulate stable coins, this, that, and the other. And it's like, hold on, 12 months ago, you said the crypto space is too small and it's meaningless. And now it's the biggest threat to your uh, well-being. Yeah, one of the, I think, most proud moments of 2019 for me was when Jerome Powell, uh, the chairman of the U.S. Federal Reserve, went up and said, Bitcoin is a speculative store of value. I mean, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> like Bitcoin is now recognized as a v valid contender for store of value by the most powerful financial institution in the world. Yeah. 
I mean, Bitcoin is already starting to permeate the consciousness of the top, top people, and they haven't even bought in yet. Yeah. What happens when like these hedge fund managers or pension funds buy in? I, I couldn't be more bullish. I mean, I've waited seven years to really see this moment. You know, we went through those different eras of, of you know, 13, 14, we also had an altcoin bubble. Yeah. A lot of people forget about that, where we had Dogecoin, Frycoin. Aurora coin, yeah. Aurora coin, that was the, one of the first airdrops. Yeah. Rycoin, which had like a demurrage or demurrage, where essentially like part of the coins disappear over time, which incentivizes spending. Um, we had uh, oh Prime Coin. I mined Prime Coin. All you Bitcoiners out there, I do have a confession to make. I did mine Prime Coin at one at one time. Prime Coin found Prime numbers, and so I felt like that was more useful proof of work. Of yes. course, as I learned more about proof of work later after 14, I was like, wait a second, that was a silly idea. Hmm. Um, so people forget that there was an altcoin boom and there was the blockchain, blockchain, not Bitcoin echo. And a lot of the crypto businesses in order to get fundraising align themselves with any of those narratives, because also that's where the money was at. Hmm. And then finally you've got like the 16, 17 ICO boom. And then you have now, which is, I don't know, STOs, IEOs, not really sure. Um, yeah store value yeah a little bit of DeFi thrown in there as well i'm interviewing the guys from bzx about the uh, exploits this week as well so oh uh, that should be a really interesting interview yes yes so let's just zoom out a bit and talk about the the macro policy so this week the fed have come out and again sort of said we don't have a lot of tools and you know that's what bitcoiners have been saying for the past however many years so what, what are they going to do is power going to ramp up qe I, I just see that this is going to head down the path of possibly, you know, we, we could be talking at a trillion dollars a month in QE if the bond market decides to run for the exits to prevent a collapse. Let the games begin. Mm. <laughs> I've waited seven years to see this moment. I hypothesized this would happen and it's happening. Um, it's happening in such a spectacularly train wreck sort of way. I couldn't even imagine it being any better set up than this for Bitcoin. I mean, you've got, the president of the United States tweeting at the Federal Reserve to print more money. That's insane. Um, beyond my wildest expectations for how lunatic this would all get. Also talking about like debt forgiveness with the different presidential candidates. Um, the Republicans and the Democrats in the U.S. are both wanting to spend tons of money. Mm. There's no one being fiscally responsible because why? Like none of the population cares about you being fiscally responsible. Might as well just print as much as you can. Mm. So this is a very much a, you know, and this is a race to zero, a race to the bottom, where people will just print and print and print. And, you know, investors are being penalized and they're trying to chase and find returns. And they're looking across the whole world and they're like, where am I supposed to put my money? Yeah. Like that has cattle prodded people out of safe investments and really skewed risk reward to where now there's been massive amounts of alloc capital being allocated into riskier and riskier assets without the appropriate return or yield. Um, it's really scary. It's like the Pavlovian response where silently in the background, people have been punished who are savers. And because there's been such good returns in everything risky, well, you know, who cares about savings anymore? But now we're at this point where, okay, well, what happens if this starts to turn around at any point? And no matter what angle you look at it, it's, well, if they take interest rates more deeply negative, that makes Bitcoin more attractive. And it probably makes the banks weaker, which makes Bitcoin more attractive. If they just print more money, QE or repo markets, Bitcoin's going to boom. Now, as you said before, they're talking about just fiscally spending, modern monetary theory. That's possibly inflationary and Bitcoin's going to boom. It's just, there's no way out of this. Yeah, modern modern monetary theory. It's basically like print as much money as you like is the other term for it, right? Yeah. Oh, crazy. I mean, even that that is being considered or talked about is insulting to economics, to the basis of capitalism and free markets. It's just, I can't believe it's even gotten to this stage. I mean, maybe it makes sense though, in a way. Like maybe this was the ultimate outcome of all this. What, what I tell people is that we, we haven't had the, the light bulb moment for 99% of people because in places like the US, which is basically seen as the, the king of world finance, and even in Australia, you know, majority of our audience, interest rates are still sitting there okay. We haven't gone negative yet. Stocks are at all-time highs. You know, the price of their house is going up, their retirement fund. Everyone's like, you know, 
what, what's everyone complaining about? This is all really rosy at the moment. But as soon as that changes, it's the, the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry, I love to say, because all these currencies, they look okay relative because the US is holding up okay. But as soon as people realize that, oh, all these countries are actually printing money in these currency wars, it's a race to the bottom. Bitcoin jumps to 20,000 and people start to understand this concept. Well, hey, that's the only thing that's fixed. That's the only money in the world that's that's fixed and all these others are about to blow up their systems or, and print money into oblivion. I think that's the light bulb moment for a lot of people. Yeah, and a more compressed narrative about that, I, I agree 100%. The more compressed narrative is that there's an infinite amount of fiat dollars chasing a finite amount of Bitcoin. Mm. And that's it. We know there'll be 21 million Bitcoin. We have no idea how many fiat coins there will be. And as people scurry and try to figure out how to save and store wealth, well, where are you going to go? As as the Federal Reserve pushes you to riskier and riskier assets, as you buy homes that are 3x their valuation, you wonder, what am I doing with my capital? Where can I put that to store it and store that value over time to where it can't be you know, manipulated? Yeah. And a lot of people, I think, have a misconception around store of value, which I can clear up here, which is that a store of value must be price stable, that the purchasing power must remain constant. However, that's antithetical to a good store of value. Because if the purchasing power remained constant, that means that there's a centralized actor who can control that purchasing power. A good store of value is around the immutability, its ability to be transmitted without any sort of censorship, and the uh, hard to seize nature of it, mm. which ensures property rights and ensures sovereignty. Mm. So that's what a good store of value is. And I think a lot of people going in are like, wait, Bitcoin isn't a good store of value. It fluctuates all the time. And I'm like, well, how about gold? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm still fairly bullish on gold only because the, the the derivative market and the amount of money out there in Wall Street is just you know in the trillions or quadrillions. I think a lot of that is going to possibly seek flight to safety in gold. It's not all going to just go to Bitcoin magically. I think we've got to be a bit realistic. And you spoke about silver and gold going up and down a lot. They're still considered relatively good store of value. But another light bulb moment for people that we've, we've been talking about a lot, educating people is... When gold runs up in price, if it gets it's two thousand four hundred dollars today in Australia in Aussie dollars, when it keeps going up, gold miners are going to increase their production. That's going to come online and it's going to increase the supply, and that is the opposite to what's going to happen with the Bitcoin halving. And again, I think it's these one by one people understand these concepts. Yeah, there, as you mentioned, there's no supply response. There's no response of supply and anticipation and or real demand currently. Yeah. So you know the gold miners. Gold can go up much higher and they can produce much more more supply as they dig deeper and are willing to expend more resources. Mm. Uh, with Bitcoin, we don't have that, which is an incredibly uh, unique situation where, you know, the supply of gold has gold has been the best store of value, uh, you know, sound money that we've ever had um, due to a lot of different principles. We can dig in that, into that later. Um, but the supply issue was very, very interesting on how Satoshi thought about crafting, you know, supply. He didn't choose a permanent inflation rate or a tail emission, as a lot, a lot of people like to call it. He chose a finite quantity um, and the way that Bitcoins are produced through proof of work um, and how that supply curve looks, that issuance schedule is really fascinating. Uh, you know, why put, why put the happenings every four years? Why not six? Why not two? You know, why have the supply get cut in half? Why not by one third? Mm. So these are, it's really fascinating that Bitcoin actually worked, given that a lot of these were, you know, somewhat guesstimates. Um, but I do think that Satoshi might have, this is largely extrapolation, but that Satoshi, you know, looked at like the four year cycles that we give presidents in the US mm. and that that's enough time for them to do, make change. And four years is enough time to build products and raise money and hire. Uh, two years would be really intense and then 10 years might be too long or like eight years might be too long to mm -hmm. where, you know, people have career risk then if things t take off too slowly. So I think there's some method to the madness as to why four years per happening was chosen. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I really agree. I think there's, you know, people look at stock markets and they talk about seven year cycles or 10 year cycles and whatnot, but Bitcoin trades 24 seven. And I think that four year period, it's the perfect amount of time to go through that Wall Street cheat sheet of emotions and um yeah i mean you can make all the theories in the world but it's just every little intricate part of uh of bitcoin is brilliant the more you learn about it and, and that does take a few years i think that's why in the pre-interview we're saying it's so hard for these guys from the traditional finance background to comprehend it because it's tying together not just 
what they know about finance and economics, but it's computer science and you know human emotion and all these other concepts wrapped into this uh, miracle new digital money. Yeah, I mean, when you study finance in undergrad, they don't teach you what money is. Yeah, I think that's the that's the, that's the crazy moment when you graduate. You're like, wait, what is money? You just kind of assume it's whatever your state has issued as as legitimate currency, and you never really challenge like the assumptions of what makes a good money versus yeah. a bad. It's just like, well, stocks, bonds. <laughs> you just look at how to allocate capital within like the somewhat limited construct that you're given by your state. Are you familiar with Steve Kane, Professor Steve Kane? I don't think I am. Oh, so he's an economics professor in Australia that's been, you know, waving the flag and warning people since before the GFC about how this is all going to end badly. And he, one of the things he often speaks about is how economics degrees don't teach you, or economic models that even the Fed uses don't take into account banks' debt and money, which is just insane to think about. Oh yeah, it's crazy. They don't take into account a lot of different factors, and it's the same sort of factors that led to the 2008 financial crisis, where. You know, in these mortgage-backed securities, the variable plugged into the model was that all mortgage, you know, mortgages across the or values of homes in the U.S. across the country all didn't fall at the same time historically, and so literally every single financial model now is built on a similar shaky set of foundations of assumptions that, yeah. like, yeah, like it's like, oh well, my government won't won't enter into hyperinflation. It's like, why, why wouldn't it? Um, yeah, it, it's crazy. Back in the GFC, we had the um, collateralized debt obligations, wasn't it? And now we've got the collateralized loan obligations where we've got a trillion dollars in corporate debt, which is just going down the same path of, oh, it'll be okay. If anything bad ever happens, we'll print more money. Let's package these corporate debt loans of companies that are zombie companies that aren't making any money. Um, they're just borrowing more to buy back shares and to you know issue more bonds. It's just this big game that it, it can't go on forever. Right. And eventually, you know, people will choose to preserve their wealth. And a lot of times, I mean, it's kind of funny, like Bitcoin teaches you a ton about human psychology. You know, there is no Bitcoin doesn't have a cash flow sort of analysis. There's no, you know, there's no government or bank or economic like academy or university that has given Bitcoin its legitimacy. Mm. It earned it through cold, hard, rational thinking. Um, which is incredible, but it also requires you to challenge your assumptions of authority where like you trust your universities, you trust your government, you trust your banks and Bitcoin's like, what if you didn't have to trust them? Or what if, what if they're wrong? And to learn more about Bitcoin, it challenges those assumptions that you have with these institutions. And it somewhat, you know, somewhat requires that you have to completely deny their existence or like deny that like their, their thought process is rational because it leads you to Bitcoin and you're like, this is this is what it should be. Yeah. So funny you say that, yeah. It, when part of, part of my journey were, that like left a massive mark on me was when I did the pharmacy degree and then I was working in the real world and a lot of what they teach you is just whatever big pharma wants you to think and that's the idea of the world. You get these people on these drugs and they're on them for life. But the reality is that 90% of medical conditions can get fixed if you eat really healthy and have a good balanced lifestyle and do some exercise, go back to what we're eating for thousands of years. But you try telling people that and it's like trying to tell people in the financial world about you know, about Bitcoin and about how this other system isn't working the way it's meant to and the world isn't the way that, you're, you know, it's portrayed to you in even university, let alone high school. So being able to think outside the square, um, so many people are open-minded in this space. I mean, you go to a meetup and you have these awesome conversations and people find it hard that are watching this video at home. They'll go to work tomorrow and say, watch this cool video, this guy, Dan Held from Kraken and whatnot, and their friends are just oblivious. They don't care about money or their, their, their wealth or their retirement. Yeah, it's really tricky, and I've I've probably talked over the last seven years and eight years. I've probably talked to like over probably like five thousand people about Bitcoin. You know, I mean, all the dates. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the dates. I apologize to all the girls I annoyed on dates <laughs> about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, friends, all the acquaintances, all the meetups, all the X, Y, or Z, right? Coworkers, family members, and so I like to think of it as cards you can play. So you go into a situation and you meet a baby boomer. Well, that individual is going to respond to a certain set of behavioral sort of characteristics. So uh, they're gonna like gold because they're old and they like phys physicality of things. So you play that card. Mm. Uh, Bitcoin's a gold 2.0 or you've got a younger millennial 
where you play the digital, digitally native card, right? So there's not a one size fits all theme or narrative for Bitcoin for converting someone. I mean, they all center around store of value, but there's different methods to get them hooked initially and then get them to that sort of objective. And the way I like to frame it is that you've seen the movie Inception, right? Yeah. So one of my favorite scenes in the movie is Leonardo DiCaprio trying to convince Tom Hardy to join his team. It's at the Moroccan cafe. And so Leo leans over to Tom and he goes, I have a crazy idea. It's called Inception. And Tom goes, well, it's not that crazy of an idea, but you have to start with the most primitive version of that idea. And so he goes, we don't start with breaking up his father's empire because the, the core theme of the, the movie is that they're going to incept this idea in this younger gentleman's head to when he inherits his father's empire to break it up into uh, separate individual pieces and then sell those. Hmm. He goes, we can't start with that. We have to start with the relationship with his father. That's the core root of inception. And for Bitcoin, we don't start with Bitcoin. We have to start with a relationship with their government. That is the true beginning of where people start to question their nature of the reality, where people go, wait, what if this system isn't right? Hmm. Then you point to Bitcoin as a solution to the broken, broken system. And it makes a lot more sense that way. Yeah, in terms of um, the other features of Bitcoin, um, we mentioned before about Microsoft piggybacking off that network. Do you think that's something that can also add a lot of value and bring people in when they realize that this is, you know, technically not the most secure computer network in the world, as some people say, but it is, you know, proof of work is making it very, very secure for someone like Microsoft to build uh, and piggyback off the back of that? Yeah, so I know Daniel Buckner over there who heads up that program. Um, I think what they're doing makes a ton of sense. I mean, at a core fundamental component, like Bitcoin's proof of work is a time stamping mechanism. I think even Satoshi refers to it as time chain yeah. in the original code. Yeah. It's not necessarily a blockchain, it's a time chain. Yeah. So, you know, to stamp other data in that chain makes a lot of sense. So you would just have a normal Bitcoin transaction with maybe hashed data from another service, like Veriblock did this as well, where they take a hash of the Veriblock chain and then store that and uh, you know, in a Bitcoin transaction. Yeah. So Bitcoin can kind of be the core root backbone of truth. And the first purpose of that was to store transactional data of the native token Bitcoin. Mm. You know, I think that's where a lot of people took the idea of blockchain and they're like, well, what if we can do this with everything else? But they forget that the native token itself represents so much more functionality than just uh, being a token. They're like, well, the native token also incentivizes miners to behave properly via the block reward. Yeah. It's also the issuance of new currency, so the issuance schedule. Um, and it's also the unforgeable costliness of the new units being created. That no Bitcoin was created via a uh, via free lunch. Mm -hmm. You either had to earn it through proof of work or earn it through earning money, which is also a form of proof of work. Yeah. So people forget that like you can't just take blockchain and remove the native token because you remove all of that very intricate functionality. Yeah. Um, but eventually, you know, Bitcoin's blockchain could store other data on it. Um, you can th kind of think of it as like Bitcoin's block space being a parcel of real estate. And right now, like what makes the most sense and what will make the most sense for a long time in the future is a certain type of tenant, mm. it's a store of value transactor, the person who wants to store their value in Bitcoin and then move that Bitcoin occasionally. Now, the thing is, there's a limited amount of square footage. So you can only have so many people who can bid or transact in that block space for whatever use case you'd like. Mm. Um, because of that finite amount, it means that only the use cases where the data stored is very, very valuable yeah. will be viable ideas. Um, you know, transactor data or store of value makes sense because that's a large amount of wealth being moved. Um, maybe aggregate identities, you know, with the Microsoft project, maybe the aggregate identities of a million people might be valuable enough yeah. um, or other financial data, right? So I think the Ethereum community largely ignores this problem um, and kind of brushes it under the rug, which is that whatever uh, pro protocol market fit your protocol finds, like Bitcoin's a store of value, that use case will crowd out every other use case because they all have to bid for the same block space. Mm. They're all bidding for the same fixed amount of real estate. So like if Ethereum ever became, you know, more popular in the DeFi side and those DeFi transactions were very, very large in value, 
then that would crowd out everything like NFTs and the crypto kitties and everything else because those transactors to get into that block space will outbid anyone else to get their transaction in. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I do think that some of these things are going to be solved. And even, well, we saw Gods Unchained. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, Ethereum car project. They have, they're, they're doing hundreds of transactions um, and not clogging up the block space. So yeah, I'm hoping these problems are going to be solved. But that does lead me into that next question about the payment side of things. So obviously, some of the critics say, uh, you know, the title of the white paper is peer to peer electronic cash. Now, cash, I think, can still mean money to some people, and Bitcoin can still be this money where you and I can send it to each other. But is it going to be really good, and should it be able to do micro transactions for everyone in the world? So, are you, are you a believer that? The liquid side chains, Lightning Networks, and other things are going to eventually solve these issues? Or for you, that's really still small in terms of how important the digital gold narrative is? Yeah, so first and foremost, digital gold is the largest totable, total addressable market out there, TAM, as the tech as space likes to call it. So the TAM of store of value is in the hundreds of trillions. Um, there is no larger TAM in existence of all commerce. Yeah. It's money, it's the core store of value mechanism. So when people go, oh, wouldn't it be a shame if Bitcoin never did this, this, and this, and this? I'm like, wait, so you're complaining about Bitcoin tackling the biggest possible addressable market by magnitudes, like 100x magnitude, and you're complaining that it's not going to do all these other things? A lot of people that, that, that you know, I'm, and this isn't directed at you, I'm just talking about the community in general. A lot of, a lot of these individuals are engineers. They built mobile products, they built web apps, and you know they really want that tinkery sort of vibe where nothing's ever finished in tech. You always want to tinker and fix, fiddle with it and fix it and, yeah. and do whatever you'd like with it, right? And so you know, I think that sort of comes into play here, which is that you know, people just have, it's irresistible to tinker with things. Um, and yeah, it, it's essentially, you know, with with that, it, 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 you, when, the more and more you tinker with it, the less and less you really understand the core principle of like how Satoshi programmed in the rules of the twenty one million hard cap to prevent that from happening. Yeah, I mean, I actually think some of the Lightning wallets and apps are. The, I know they're custodial at the moment, but it's actually already fairly easy to use Lightning. And in Australia, you can buy your coffee at plenty of shops already. Like, it's not that hard to do. And so to dig in on the payment side a bit, you know, like I had a tweet storm based on like what what, what were Satoshi's original intentions when he created Bitcoin. Um, you know, for example, the word cash used in that context does not mean cash in your pocket. Mm. By any definition of the contextual definition, it does not mean that. Um, Satoshi was referencing other white papers before him called like eCash and hash cash. And cash in that context meant because remember, Satoshi published his white paper to a group of nerds called the cypherpunks on the cryptographer email list. Yeah. These individuals used the word cash before him, and he's using the word cash to resonate in terms of finality. Mm. Cash is one way payment after you pay someone in cash and they run away with it, it's gone. Yes. Finality and privacy. Now, later we would learn that privacy is very, very hard to accomplish, um, but that's what he means by the word cash. Now. We can look at a whole host of other Satoshi's writings if we want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, some of the other, uh, you know, just a couple bullet points here. You know, one is the only message he ever wrote in the blockchain was UK Chancellor on the verge of second bailout for banks, yeah. not uh, on the verge of raising processing fees. And the first message he posts after the white paper is that he says the core root of the problem starts with central banks. Mm. And then additionally as well, he refers to Bitcoin as being a precious metal four or five times. Um, he goes, and for instance, he says, you know, verbatim, he goes basically, imagine a metal that is like colorless and has no other functionality other than being scarce, mm. has no utility. And that's verbatim, no utility other than being scarce. I still think people would pick that up. Mm. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Interesting points. Um, any any thoughts on the Craig Wright debacle at the moment? I mean, he's uh, what was the, the last couple of weeks he's been talking about the bonded courier and now he's talking about... Uh, BCH have used his database without his permission, even though he was one of the people that started BCH. Yeah, it's clear that uh, Craig Wright is not Satoshi. Uh, we have a literal mountain of evidence that suggests otherwise. Um, yeah, he's just kind of a waste of everyone's time to talk about. Cool. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, it's funny that he's uh, it is an Australian, but anyway, we won't get into <laughs> get into that. Um, you guys have cool people, though. I mean, Michael Dunworth, a uh, good buddy of mine over at uh, Wire. He's a Nuggets News uh, fan as well. I'm interviewing Michael soon, so yeah. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, you know, you guys are uh, Australians are some of my favorite people. You guys have some good crypto people. Craig Wright's, I think, an outlier. Awesome. That's nice of you to say, Dan. Um, speaking of Australians, you guys recently purchased, uh, is it Bittrade and Jonathan, another one of my Aussie mates, um, a quack, quack and a cry then? Yeah, we uh, we made some moves in Australia. You know, for us, I think we're looking at what are, we're capable of. You know, expanding and like, you know, we we're a big company, right? We've got a ton of employees. We're distributed across the world, and we've got a certain set of prioritizations in terms of geo expansion. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we can do that geo expansion by ourselves, and sometimes we can do it much better if we acquire another company. And so that's where I think you're kind of seeing crack and fill in some of those gaps in our, our coverage, whether it be products or geo coverage with companies that do that really well in that region. People are crypto mad in Australia. So there's, there's something like 250 registered exchanges um, last time oh, wow. I checked. So. In Australia alone? Yeah. Wow. I can't imagine the volume would be very high in some of those. No, a lot of them are like individual traders because you have to get registered with AS, um, Austrack and whatnot. But still, like there literally is so many exchanges in Australia. But um, I'm sure you guys will do well. Um, anything we haven't touched on already, Dan? It's, um, I think the US dollar milkshake theory is one that I like to talk about. We kind of touched on this before that the, all the strength and money is going into the US dollar most of the world's uh, debt is denominated in US dollars and that puts a big um, demand constantly for dollars. You said before when Jerome Powell um, said that Bitcoin's a speculative store of value, that was a massive moment. I think the second largest moment last year was when Mark Carney from the Bank of England came out and said, it's not fair that US dollars are the world reserve currency that got too many privileges. That was a huge moment. And I think moving away, as soon as the US dollar loses that status, that's just another light bulb moment where things just change. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is going to be huge. I mean, these systems are kind of held together with a thread uh, as each country chooses to be, you know, act in its own best interest. And as the U.S. dominance over the world and each country deciding to, ter- to determine their own fate, uh, we'll slowly see people and eventually there'll be confederates of these former, you know, combined combined monetary systems like the EU. We'll see confederates like how long will the Germans continue to feel bad for World War II. Like it's been, was it three, four generations now? I mean, how, what's the liability? What's How long does liability last, right? And they're only gonna feel guilty for so much longer to pay for the rest of Europe and really support them. And eventually one of these countries like them or maybe Turkey or someone else decides to go to the Bitcoin standard and their central bank will secretly buy up some and then maybe when it pumps, they go, well, actually, all of our currency is backed by Bitcoin. And so, you know, you don't even really need a bigger country to to opt into Bitcoin. You can just have a smaller country opt in and everyone else starts to kick off the game theory of going, well, wait, what if the Bank of England bought and we didn't buy? Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the things that I love to talk about as well. What is anything worth now that fiat money is not really backed by anything? And it used to be this dynamic between Russia and China and the US. We don't know that China is not printing as much money as they can just to buy up all the oil. Or in Australia, they're buying up lots of land and businesses and we're selling a lot of it to it. But that's what I'm just worried about. You know, We don't know that they're not just printing money. And sooner or later, a country or a central bank can just start printing as much money as they want to try and buy up all the Bitcoin and nothing is backed by anything except for Bitcoin that we know is the only thing that's digital and scarce. Yeah, well, they have to buy it from a hodler. A hodler has to be willing to sell. Um, <laughs> and if they buy into Bitcoin, it pushes up the price, which increases the awareness, the adoption, Bitcoin security, and liquidity, which enables more participants to get in. So I, I welcome the, uh, the mad game theoretic rush that should occur in the future. I mean, all we have to do is bet that humans and institutions will want to make money. That's it. That's the only assumption we have to plug in. Mm. People choose to be greedy and buy in, ex- in expectation of increasing value. Will pensions try to plug their underfunded amount by buying a small allocation of Bitcoin? Will hedge funds choose to be greedy to earn really juicy returns because they earn two and 20? Will they not allocate one to 10% into Bitcoin? And then finally, will central banks, will one be a confederate? Will one go, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go buy some Bitcoin. And I think the answer to all of that is, Yes, that will occur at some point. If it doesn't, then Bitcoin will have failed, which is fine. The world will go on. It'll 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 suck. But I've been in the space for seven years, and I've never been more bullish than we are now in terms of the amount of infrastructure built, Mm. the amount of believers, the amount of content. I mean, back 
I remember when I added CoinDesk to the zero block newsfeed. So, you know, we, we used to scrape the R Bitcoin hot subreddit. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember when two bit idiot, you know, Ryan Selkis came out with his blog. He was one of the first bloggers in the space. Mm. Uh, Bitcoin talk was where like the whole conversation happened. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we have magnitudes difference in terms of infrastructure, companies, individuals, VC capital, liquidity, you know, if it fails here, it gave it its best shot, but I don't think it will. And that's why I'm betting a significant portion of my net worth on it, yeah. as I think most of us are. And now there's a million people on that Bitcoin subreddit. Um, when when Bitcoin was around $30, for me, the far off target was $3,000, you know, 100x. But I definitely didn't understand all the nuances around Bitcoin at the time. And for me, the narrative was just about the unfunded liabilities and whatnot. They're going to have to print money to get out of this. But at the time, we didn't have negative interest rates. We didn't really have right. a huge QE. We didn't have hyperinflation. Um, I wasn't even fully aware about how money worked and the different um, currencies around the world you know there's a hundred currencies and they've all got market caps bigger than bitcoin and they're just all going to be disrupted um yeah as oh. i said I, I completely agree that i'm more bullish now than when bitcoin was 30 dollars. yeah i mean the the aggregate shared belief in bitcoin is much higher mm. like when it was 30 dollars, it was only worth 30 dollars because that's what we all thought it was worth in aggregate yeah and so now that it's worth this much and the market cap is this high it means that bitcoin has achieved certain milestones of adoption and belief the only way to really kill Bitcoin is to kill the belief in Bitcoin in each one of our minds. Mm. So even if you disrupted the protocol, we would simply go, okay, well, does everyone agree that the ledger as of this date was accurate? And sure, some things will get lost, but it will still maintain and be preserved. Uh, the only way to kill it is to destroy the idea of it in each one of our heads. And like, that's the only way to kill dollars. It's the same thing. Like, it doesn't matter how much the federal government attests to the legitimacy of the dollar. All that matters is our belief in it. And so that's the only reason why it has value. And that's the reason why Bitcoin has value. And its price right now is a testament to the number of hodlers and believers in it, which I'm so excited to see it ever make it this far. I mean, <laughs> Silk Road got shut down, Mt. Gox collapsed. We weren't sure if it was going to come back. Exactly. Yeah. Probably the last couple of things I'd like to hear your thoughts on were um, these are things I spoke about with Jimmy Song, so more technical aspects about privacy. So all of those features and soft forks and upgrades are coming in probably the next 12 to 24 months, which again is going to make Bitcoin probably more valuable um, in people's eyes. The fact that it gives you more privacy, maybe that gets more pushback from governments. And the other thing about that unstoppable nature is the, the satellites, the mesh networks, the ground stations, you can send Bitcoin over text message if you don't have an internet connection. A lot of these solar farms in, I'm in Australia now don't you know require the electricity where the whole Bitcoin network, I think, is the first to get to 100% renewable. So there's so many things that make it uh, unstoppable. Yeah, I'm really bullish on you know sending Bitcoin via a ham radio or satellite transmission. I think that that's personally what I geek out on. I've actually got a Bitcoin talk forum post from 2013 where I talk about that. Um, so I've been thinking about this a long time, which is like how to build hyper resiliency. I mean, that's what Bitcoin is really about is that yeah. Bitcoin itself is stable. The protocol is incredibly stable. It has a higher uptime than Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple. Mm. Now the price of Bitcoin fluctuates because that's the volatility of the world entering the stability of Bitcoin's protocol and ebbs and flows. And so, you know, when people talk about you know, ultra resilient systems, Bitcoin is a testament at building the most resilient system ever created. Now, propagating Bitcoin transactions and propagating that chain data is really critical to it surviving enormous challenges like thermonuclear warfare um, or other ones that would be immediately, you know, super devastating for traditional systems. And due to the, you know, due to how compact and tight Bitcoin's blockchain is, that does enable us to do really cool things like that where we can uh, propagate Bitcoin via you know, radio transmission or satellites. Awesome, Dan. I think that's most of the talking points that I wanted to get through today. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want people to at home to uh, know? Well, I'm pretty sure if they let us keep talking, we could talk for a couple hours. So this might, this might be a good stopping point with a super bullish take on you know, crazy satellite and radio transmissions. Absolutely. We'll definitely have to do it again in future. Um, I really enjoyed that. I'll put the links to follow all your work down below, guys. Um, and yeah, any, any final thoughts for people at home, Dan? Uh, you know, if you're interested in exploring more, I would recommend, you know, digging in, reading the Bitcoin standard. Uh, if you're looking at really a really simple explanation of Bitcoin's proof of work, 
or Bitcoin's uh, origin story, check out my website, danheld.com. We've got Planting Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin's origin story, and Proof of Work is Efficient, which goes through why Bitcoin uses a lot of energy and why that's okay. Awesome. I'll link to that down below. But uh, it's been a fantastic uh, chat, mate. Anything, everything I hoped it would be, and I hope you guys have enjoyed that one at home. So cheers. Really appreciate you having me. Cheers. cheers.